Welcome to Calvary Church, and thanks for joining us for Summer Reading Series. These laid-back teachings feature different contemporary authors speaking from their published work, plus an interactive Q&A. Each has a passion for a topic that we hope you'll find interesting and relevant to you and your life. Feel free to enjoy this teaching poolside, or on the back patio, or wherever you do during summer. This is Summer Reading Series. Good evening. You are the brave bunch. You were bold enough to come out on a broiling night, and we thank you for it. So we're going to begin our time in prayer, so if you'll join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to gather tonight to open up your word, to take communion, to fellowship, to worship, and maybe learn something along the way. So we pray that you would just be glorified in and through this evening, and we give you the glory. Amen. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil, crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell, the soil is bare now. Nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And through the last lights of the black west went, O morning, at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah with bright wings. That poem was written by a clergyman by the name of Gerard Manley Hopkins. And he wrote it in 1877. One commentator wrote concerning this poem, a natural world through which God's presence runs like an electrical current becoming visible and flashes like light. And if I were to tell you tonight that God has written poetry, flashes of light since the beginning of time, and more so we can hear and see God's poetry in the world, what would you think? Well, I don't think you would be that surprised. Why? Well, after all, the Lord inspired one-third of the Bible to be written in poetry, as the Psalms attest. And as universe, that which is around us this very moment is a place full of electric current, to use the phrase of the commentator. We can find God's fingerprints everywhere. It was the Apostle Paul who reminded us in Romans chapter 1 that creation points to a creator. So generally, we find God's poetry, his handiwork, if you will, in creation. But specifically, we find God's poetry in three unique areas. Number one, and this is the ultimate expression, is found in the Word, capital W-O-R-D, in Jesus himself. Paul says that Jesus is the icon of God. That's the word Paul uses, icon. Jesus is the painting of God. He makes that which is invisible, visible. So first, Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's poetry. But secondly, his word, lowercase w-o-r-d, the Bible. 
And then thirdly, where we find God's poetry is in his people. We are the poema of God, to use the word the Apostle Paul used in Ephesians 2.10. We are God's masterpiece. So God's poetry is written generally in creation and specifically in Christ, in his word, and in his people. So our goal in the next few minutes before we have communion is to discover some of the visible flashes of light God left for us to see. So I'm going to do three things with you briefly. Number one, I'm going to explain the field of theopoetics. And then we're going to expound a key verse in Genesis chapter 1. I hope you brought your Bible. If you didn't, the verse we're going to be covering is very, very familiar. But number two, I'm going to express elements of a theopoetic life. How I have personally integrated theopoetics in my own journey. So I'll be singing a song during communion, and I'll be reading a poem. But then three, we're going to explore some elements of theopoetics, and I'll invite Matt back up, and we'll do a question and answer and interview. But first, let's, let's look at theopoetics. Matt threw that word out to you guys, and we didn't see too many hands. So what is theopoetics? It's a subfield of theology and philosophy. The word poetics originates from the Greek word poetry. And the word theo originates from the Greek word God. So theopoetics is God poetry or the poetry of God. But more specifically, theopoetics is cultivating creativity and using it as theology or to teach about God. It's using human creative outlets to express God's beauty, truth, and goodness. The greatest example, or one of the greatest examples in the Bible is King David. Poet, musician, king. And he wrote his poems that aren't just beautiful poetry, but they're also theology. That is an example of theopoetics. So essentially, theopoets use creativity and imagination, language, story, metaphor, poetry, dance, architecture, the whole entire artistic realm to explore the ongoing dialogue of our relationship to God. We use creativity to explore the Christian faith. So that's what theopoetics is about. Now that you have a general idea of what theopoetics is, I invite you to turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Now there are a lot of chapters or verses we can use to explore theopoetics. But we're going to start with the first that sets the stage. It is the foundation upon which not just theopoetics, but all of theology is rooted in. In verse 1 of Genesis chapter 1, it reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This has to be one of the most recognizable verses ever written. Books, entire books, are written on that one verse alone. Artwork has been created. Think of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Poems and music have been composed based upon it. We know that line well in the beginning. For our purposes tonight, and briefly, we're going to look at four aspects of this one verse. And then we're going to jump down to verse 26. We're going to look at a place, a person, a procedure, and then draw some principles. 
First, let's look at place. In the beginning. In Hebrew, that phrase is actually one word. It's reshith. And it means first in place, time, or rank. It carries the idea of a principal beginning or the existence of all things. It gives us our place in time. Somewhere in time past, our four-dimensional existence, length, width, height, and time, began to exist. How long ago? We don't know. Scientists and scholars debate it back and forth. But what we do know, both from science and from Scripture, is that there was a beginning. So that's place. Second is a person. And we learn in the verse that in the beginning, God. Now, to us, we just look at that word and we go, oh, we've heard that many times. But that word for God is very, very unique. In Hebrew, it is Elohim. And Elohim means the supreme being or the living God. Elohim, interestingly, carries connotations of plurality, of more than one. Not that there's more than one God, but there's a plurality to God's nature. Some commentators find hints of the Trinity here. The fellowship within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm going to teach you a word. In theology, we call this fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit parakehesis. Go ahead, say that. Parakehesis. That means the mutual exchange of love and will within the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So some see Elohim as referencing God's triune nature. Others see this plurality representing or referring to God's nature, his various attributes, characteristics of the one true God, such as God is love, God is holy, God is just, God is beautiful, and Elohim encapsulates all of those attributes of God. So we have a place in the beginning. We have a person, Elohim, God. And then we have a procedure. What does Elohim do? Well, the text tells us he created. The Hebrew word for created is bara. It means simply to create or to make. It carries the idea of someone cutting down wood and fashioning it such as a sculptor would. Biblical scholar Stephen Schweitzer points out that this form of bara is exclusive to God alone. Schweitzer writes, This act of creation is unique to God alone. Humans may participate with God or in God's ongoing creative acts, but humans do not bara, end quote. And what Schweitzer means is only God can create something from nothing. There was nothing, and God spoke it into existence. Humans, on the other hand, we require something to create something. So what did Elohim create? He created the heavens. That is the celestial world, the seen and unseen. This includes the metaphysical world of Laws, physical laws, and math principles, all that we can't see. God created that. But God also created the earth, the physical world. So he created that which we can see. In short, God created all things, both the seen and unseen. So we have a place in the beginning. 
We have a person, Elohim, God. We have a procedure. He created. He bara. And what are some principles we could draw from this? One I've already alluded to. Both the physical and non-physical world are the thoughts of God made visible. Think of that. What you're looking at right now are the thoughts of God made visible. So look at this tree. That's God's thoughts made visible. Hold out your hand. Go ahead. Hold out your hand. Look at it. That is the thoughts of God made visible. The water running behind me, the mountains east of us, all of these are thoughts of God made visible. And not just the physical world, but physics and math. These are thoughts of God made visible. It's a profound thought. And because these are God's thoughts made visible, we as human beings are also God's thoughts made visible. And we as par participants in God's creative order can enjoy and explore God's creation. We could ponder and probe it. We could participate in it. In a way, this creation, this world, is a map or a country for us to navigate and discover. Be it the sciences or the arts or the humanities, our world is an open book, a gift from God. True, our world has been marred by sin, but I believe we could still find the facets of God's grace all over this place, allowing us to find Christ in culture. Interestingly, Paul tells us in Colossians that God, the Father, created all things through Jesus Christ. And the Greek word that Paul uses for all is pas in Greek. And it means whosoever, whatsoever, all things. So Paul is telling us that God the Father, through Christ, created everything that is. And because of that, we can find glimpses of God's grace everywhere in this world. After all, Jesus made the invisible God visible, and he's left his fingerprints for us to see. So my point is because God created all things, we too can explore them, finding God's presence among his people, among his creation. So that's verse 1. Jump down to verse 26. It simply reads, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, there is a lot to this verse. I don't have time to unpack it all. But let me make a couple of observations. Number one, the Hebrew word for make means to make, fashion, or accomplish. So one way you and I, human beings, are like God is that we are creative beings, just as God is a creative being. We have the capacity to form and fashion things. We have the capacity to think and use our imagination. We can participate with God as co-creators in creation. But also notice that we're made in his image. The Hebrew word for image means to represent or to figure. I don't think God the Father is in human form. Jesus tells us that God is spirit, but Jesus was in human form. So when the text tells us that we're made in God's image, it's not saying that we're made in a human form, like a spiritual form, but it is an incorporeal context. We are like God spiritually. We are like God imaginatively. We have a will and thought just like God. 
Furthermore, the text tells us that we are made according to God's likeness. Likeness uh, means simply shape, fashion, or manner. So we are made in God's image, in his likeness. Interestingly, Stephen Schweitzer, the biblical scholar I referenced already, points out that this statement was radical for its day. In other creation narratives, be it Egyptian or Babylonian, kings alone bore the image of God. But in Genesis 1, the extension is to all humanity, you and me. All of us are made in God's image, male and female, regardless of class or status. This is a profound statement, folks. So what does it suggest? First, it suggests that we're free moral beings. Like God, we love, we feel, we think, we emote. Number two, we have fellowship with God and with one another. Just like Elohim had fellowship, parokehesis, Mutual fellowship among the Godhead. We too can fellowship. And three, we fashion. Meaning we could form and make things. We are creative beings. So we are like God when we think, when we create, when we love. And the implications are that as image bearers of God, whether we know it or not, we are reflecting certain of God's characteristics. In other words, we could find God's fingerprints, as I've noted, in human creative endeavors. When we humans create, we find echoes or signposts of Imago Dei that we're made in God's image. And this is what my book, Tilt, explores. I go out and explore different cultural endeavors, looking for God's fingerprints in our society. I know it's a lot to chew on. I gave you a lot in a short period of time. But I'm going to move to our next section, which is express. And I've spent the last 35 years of my life exploring the integration of the arts and the Christian life. I've done it through music, art, poetry, teaching, and writing. And let me tell you, there's joy in the journey. And let me say that my journey may be different from yours. You may like fixing cars, or carpentry, or interior designing, or flower arrangements, or cooking, or just being a fantastic mom, dad, or grandpa. And that's great. But just remember that these are all creative acts, and by creating, you are working in God's image. So to give you an idea of some of the things I engage with Theopoetics, I'm going to sing a song and read a poem from my book, Tilt. But I also paint weekly and do a lot of other creative things just like you. The song, which I hope the lyrics will be on the screen for you to read when we get there, was written in the 1990s. It's called Testament of Devotion. It's taken from a classic work, a devotional work by the same name. And the emphasis of the song is, our pursuit pleases God. It's a call to surrender to the Savior. And then the poem I'll read immediately after the song is called For Riley and the Angels. It's a poem I wrote about the death of my son, Riley. After he died, it literally took me years and years and years to write anything about him. But when I did, a poem was birthed. And what I want you to understand through the poem is that pain can produce purpose. And so... I'm going to invite Pastor Antonio up, who's going to lead us in communion. He's going to share a short devotional. And then after he's finished, 
I'm going to sing the song and read the poem. And I pray that you would use both the song and the poem as a time to just reflect on what God did in Christ, another father looking down at the death of his own son. Pastor Antonio. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for being here and let you all know that we love you. And uh, you, you brave the heat tonight, so we want to enjoy and, and thank you for, for being out here. We're going to switch gears here uh, tonight. Now, many of you probably, as you were coming in, you received a small communion element. If you did not get a communion element, don't worry. The communion board's going to get up right now, and they're going to distribute to anybody who still needs a communion element. So if you did not get one, just raise your hand, and the guys from the communion board will go around and distribute those to you. Now... I wanted to talk a little bit about communion and, and a little bit about how communion has changed in my own life. And I wanted to talk a little bit about communion when I was a, a small kid and communion when I was a young adult. And I went to a traditional church. And uh, communion, when we took communion, it was pretty regular. It was uh, what you would call traditional communion. And we took it on a routine basis, right? And for a young man and even a young adult, you didn't really, I didn't really think about what communion meant, what it signified. It was just a routine thing that we did, and you really didn't think too much about it. But when I became born again, when I became a, a true follower of Christ, my view of communion had changed. And I want to share with you a little bit about what God used to break my mind, so to speak, of the routineness of communion. And so I want to go to the scripture and read a little bit about what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He was writing in his first letter to them in chapter 11, and he said to the church, he says, For I, Paul, received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks for that bread, he broke that bread. And he said to them, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, I want to focus on a few words, and as I do that, you can go ahead and remove that, that thin saran wrap layer from the communion element. I want to focus on two words. One, broken. He broke the bread. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And what the Lord used to change my mind and to get me to think about what communion really is because he says do this in remembrance of me he said that his body is broken for us now for me what the Lord used to get my mind to change about what communion is is that when he went to the cross it was very violent it was very brutal it was very raw and the Bible tells us that his bones were not broken, but his skin, his flesh, they were torn. It was broken with every blow of the rod, with every fist that collided with him, with every whip that went against his back, with every scourging, with every thorn, with every nail. And finally, with that spear, his flesh was literally torn and broken for us, for our sins. And that gave a whole new meaning to communion for me. And when he says, do this in remembrance of me, I think of the raw brutality that my Savior went through to pay the punishment for my sins. And so the Lord used that scripture to change my mind when he says, do this in 
remembrance of me. Now I remember the rawness and the brutality of what he went through for my sin. And so perhaps if communion is a routine thing for you, imagine that brutality, that violence that he had gone through for your sin and for my sin and do it in remembrance of him. So as we take the bread, let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for enduring the violence, for enduring the brutality, for enduring the pain, that for your enemies you would die on a cross so that their sins could be atoned for and paid, never to be remembered against us. And so, Father, thank you for sending your Son because you loved us and you sent him to die for us. And so, truly, we take this bread that was broken in remembrance of what he did for us. Let's take the bread. Now, he also continues, Paul, and he said, in the same manner, he, Jesus, also took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And it says it uses that language in the same manner. Now, for every blow that Jesus took, that broke his flesh, that ripped his flesh apart, it said that he was made flesh and blood dripped, blood ran from those wounds. It fell on the ground, it fell on his face, it fell all over his body. The Bible tells us that he was marred, unrecognizable because of the violence that was against him. Red with his own blood from head to toe. And so that is the image that the Lord has used to help me to truly remember communion. To do this in remembrance of him. And I pray that from this church service you would remember that that his blood was shed all over the ground all over that wooden cross all over his own body for your sin and for my sin so we do this in remembrance of that let's take the cup now I don't want to just leave you with the raw brutality of the crucifixion. The Bible tells us to rejoice, to rejoice. And we could think of, well, that, that was a pretty brutal and pretty bloody thing that Christ went through for us. But it, the Bible tells us to rejoice. And in Romans chapter 5, Paul again tells the church in Rome, he says, for if when we were enemies of God, when we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, in other words, but wait, there's more. But not only that, but we also rejoice, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation our sins have separated us from God but through the brutal bloody crucifixion of Christ we can now rejoice because we've been made together whole with our Creator again and our sins are washed as far as the east is from the west buried in the deepest sea never to be remembered against us no more so we rejoice in that so my prayer is that every time you take communion, you will remember these things. Because Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Let us think about that and ponder that as we hear a song from Pastor Nixon.
this evening With conversations, my love Center of my solitude Breaks forth in raining joy As your still small voice leads me Unto you I yield This is my testament of devotion Lord, I sing it unto you This is my testament of devotion Lord, I sing it unto you Vestige of me can remain. Holy obedience I must follow to the end. This now sanctuary of my soul, you came to reside. Mold me now in your Father's hand. On to what you see fit Draw me to the waters of self So I can rise unto you This is my testament of devotion Lord, I sing it unto you this is my testament of devotion Lord, I sing it unto you Count me among Simple saints Who claim acceptance in these times To do your will And seek your face Soli Deo Gloria This is my testament of devotion Lord, I sing it unto you. This is my testament of devotion. Lord, I sing it unto you. When I held you, my infant child of death, did the angels weep as your mother and I? In their plurality was their unity of sorrow. In their essence did they foretell your short material existence, an accident in metaphysical language like blue to the sea. This is charity, old child to hold you but for a moment, letting your last breath be the song my lungs breathe in to sing. This is my testament of devotion. Lord, I sing it unto you. This is my testament of devotion Lord I sing it unto you
Thanks for having communion with us. Now we'll finally get to the final portion and actually talk about the book with Matt. Hi, Matt. Hey, well, you're going to be talking about the book. Well, I uh, thought you had it memorized. Oh, yeah, that, that idea. Come on, one <laughs> more time for Pastor Brian. You're a man with many titles, Brian. You're, you're uh, the closest thing that I know personally to a Renaissance man. Um, you're a pastor here. You're a doctor. You're the principal of our schools or the, the, the head of all of our schools. Um, and, Brian, if you don't know this, we had decided, like, I think two months before we opened the elementary school, we decided, hey, let's do an elementary school. And Brian Nixon was just like, hey, let's do it. Game on. We'll put together a school, and it's been phenomenal, and we're adding new grades That's right. every year. That's right. It grab- was fun. It was fun. Hey, just a reminder, if you have not written in a question yet, you still can. Um, if you go to live.calvarynm.church and to one of those of you that do write in a question, we're going to be giving away a free copy of Tilt. And Brian, you're, you're, will, you're uh, I think, willing to sign these I, I'm willing to sign it. I, I, I am, Matt. So That's tell part us, part of the Brian, contract, right? Yeah, yeah. It's part of the contract. Just kidding. Yeah, you have Just to. kidding. There's no contract. <laughs> So, Brian, you've written several books, and actually you have two that are on theopoetics. You have yep. this one, Tilt, Finding Christ and Culture. Right. And then we also have Beauty and the Banana, a theopoetic <clears throat> aesthetic. Yeah. Let, let me just, why we're doing Tilt is Tilt is much more approachable. Mm. Beauty and the Banana is, it's an academic book. It's over my head? It's not, I mean, I think anyone who wanted to give it time, but it talks about the theology and philosophy of beauty. Yeah. Um, and Theopoetics, as I mentioned, deals with truth, beauty, and goodness. And it's a subcategory of philosophy, metaphysics and philosophy. So Beauty and the Banana is a theological philosophy book. Um, but I still recommend anyone who wants to be challenged to pick it up. And what's great, I understand is that they're making it $5 tonight. Yeah, wow, that so is great. So that, that's really cheap. Um, uh, so if anyone is so inclined to read it, they, we encourage them to pick it up. We're happy to, happy to recommend that. But we are talking about Tilt. Um, you've told us a little bit about what the book is about. I would love to hear a little bit about the structure of it and how you came about the structure of Tilt. Yeah, well, Tilt came, I, I actually followed the structure of the definition of a noun. Mm. So it's, it's categorized as people, mm-hmm. places, things, and ideas. Mm. So the first section, I talk about people. Yeah. And then I talk about places, things, and ideas. And if there's a heady part of the book, it's in the ideas section. Mm. But again, I think you know, a, a, a considerate, someone who just wants to tackle some of those could even do that. But I, most of the feedback I've, I've received from people, they love or they enjoy the most the people and places section. Mm. Well, speaking of people and places, there's a lot of people in here that you there write are. about. Um, Sam Shepard, Robert Redford, Shia LaBeouf. Shia Any LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf fans out here? <laughs> yeah, All okay. two of you. one yeah. person <laughs> raise their hand for Shia LaBeouf. Well, they might not enjoy You should have that said, chapter. are there any Robert Redford okay, fans Okay, any Robert something? Redford yeah, yeah. fans out here? <laughs> so a couple more. Okay, well, of all of the places, of all of the people and the concepts, the ideas that you write about in the book, did you have maybe a favorite or one that stood out, an interview you got to conduct or a conversation you got to have or research? Yeah, well, two, two come to mind. One is Sam Shepard, who, who you mentioned. And, and most people know of Sam Shepard as the uh, Academy nominated best actor for the right stuff and so he's well known as an actor but i was first introduced to sam shepherd not as an actor but as a writer Mm. and sam shepherd is a pulitzer prize winning playwright he won the pulitzer for his plays and i remember in high school going to the library and checking out Sam Shepard wow. books. Yeah. So I was kind of a little fan. I admired Sam Shepard. And interestingly enough, how I was introduced to Sam Shepard in high school was a group by the name of U2. Yeah, okay. Borrowed some of Sam Shepard's phrases. So I was a fan of U2, 
And I thought, oh, that's cool, Hawk Moon. Where did they get that title from? And in an interview with Bono, I read that he copped it from Sam Shepard. So all of a sudden, in my mind, you know, Sam Shepard went really high. Well, yeah. you know, if Bono's quoting from him, he's got to be good. So I went and got Sam Shepard from the library, his poetry and his other writings. So I've been an admirer of him. Mm -hmm. Well, several years ago, and this is before Sam Shepard died, obviously, he was a, a fellow at the Santa Fe Institute, which is a science think tank up in, in, in Santa Fe. Many of us don't realize how many amazing things we have in our state, but Santa Fe Institute is a think tank where they're dealing with massive brain power towards the sciences. Mm. So one day my wife and I, Melanie and I, just stroll up there to go walk around. And I wanted to take a tour of the Santa Fe Institute. Mm. So by chance, I go in and Melanie's walking out in nature, which is her sweet spot, and I, I want to see, you know, where science happens. And I ask, I know I didn't make a reservation, but but is it okay if someone gives me a tour of the Santa Fe Institute? Mm. And the lady goes, oh, sure, we're slow today. I'll give you a tour of the Santa Fe Institute. So she starts telling me where this scientist works and that one. And then she walked me in to the library. And lo and behold, there was Sam Shepard. With Bono. No, not with, bon oh. not, not with Bono, but Sam Shepard by himself. And I'm sitting there, you know, I didn't want to geek out or anything, but I'm just going. And she just says nonchalantly oh Brian have you met Sam and it's like oh yeah 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 Sam and I are like this so I go no I, I, I haven't met Sam Shepard so uh, you, you know he looks up from his glasses like this kind of like who are you reaches out his hands thanks me and you know says nice meeting you and then goes on to, to do his thing so that's how I met Sam Shepard but where my investigation of Sam Shepard and the Christian influence I started to read more about Sam Shepard, mm. and I learned that he got his start in theater in Christian productions. Huh. So Sam Shepard started in Christian theater. As a matter of fact, he was doing some C.S. Lewis plays traveling around the country. Wow. And so I use that as a springboard to talk about Sam Shepard. Sure. So the second person, I'll, I'll tell everyone about happened here at church and I, I I thought it was pretty cool and he's not as well known as Sam Shepard but his name is Warner Hutchison and he is a notable classical music composer mm -hmm. and this was probably I don't know 10 years ago or something we're here at church and a lady an elderly lady faints at church and everyone throws a heart attack. Is it freaking out? Well, they get her back to the prayer room. Yeah. And I'm the pastor on call. And so I'm standing there just making sure she's all right. And she comes to, by the way, she, she was fine. She comes to, well, one of the people wanting to make small talk in this very serious moment says, Brian, have you met Warner Hutchison? He, um, he's a musician like you. And I said, oh, that's cool. And, I, and you immediately left her. Yeah, I immediately <laughs> left the lady and I went to Warner. <laughs> no, we were kind of standing in a group. And, and Warner was, you know, his elderly, is in, in his, uh, about 80 at the mm -hmm. time, I think. And I said, oh, what instrument do you, do you play? And he kind of chuckled, really sweet man. And he said, well, I used to play French horn, but I'm, I'm a, a composer now. Yeah. And I said, oh, really? And I, I said, have I heard any of your pieces? And he named off a couple. What it caused me to do was go and investigate who Warner Hutchison was. Mm -hmm. And I found out he is a very notable composer. As a matter of fact, down at New Mexico State University, yeah. there is a Warner Hutchison Music Festival wow. named in his honor. And later on, I interviewed Warner. I took him to the festival named in his honor, and I spent some time. So Warner is also mentioned in this book. But also, um, Skip is mentioned in Tilt. Mm. Skip and I go, and I won't blow it because it has something to do with Bruce Springsteen, but Skip and I go out to New Jersey. Okay. Dr. Steve Collins, who's in the audience tonight, he's in the book. Steve and I and Grant Brissett, we go up to Santa Fe, and we listen to one of the four horsemen atheists, 
Daniel Dennett. Mm. And I interview Steve and get his input about um, what his thoughts were. So the book isn't just a bunch of famous people. Mm. It is also people that we know in our own church. Yeah, that's good. Well, we have a few questions that came in from online. We've only got so much time, so I want to get to them. This is from Will, and he says, Is God still creating today like he did in Genesis, or is it finished? I would say the initial creation is, is finished. So all of the, the laws and you know, elements that were needed for creation— I believe God finished. That's why I think it tells us he rested. Not that God physically needed to rest. It's not like, whew, God says I was spent. But I think he finished from that initial creation. Now, he set in motion within creation the ability for creation to continue mm. creating. Yeah. And you and I do that as well. Yeah. We continue creating not because we're creating from nothing, but we're creating from something. And nature does that as well. It's creating from something. Hmm. So you, I've mentioned before, that you are, do many things. You're a musician. You play like, what is it, 29 instruments? No, or something like I, at my height, I played 18. Oh, okay. Only 18. Well, never mind. That's yeah, not impressive. Yeah, it's, it's not. <laughs> so 18 instruments. You're yeah. obviously a, p a poet. Yeah. And uh, you're also a painter. This I is paint. something that you do. How I often paint. are you painting? I paint every week. Every week. Is this like a discipline for you or is it like uh, oh, yeah. something? Oh, yeah. It's, it's definitely a discipline. I mean, it's a time for, for slowing down to be, to be prayerful. And I, you could ask my poor wife. Hmm. Uh, I paint every week and she'll always look at me and she'll say, what are you going to do with all these paintings? I literally have hundreds yeah. of paintings yeah. around the house. And they're incredible. Stacked up. Just stacked up. Yeah. I've gotten to see Don't them. ask me why. I just do it. So, so the question is, of all of the arts that you engage in, is there one that stands out where you experience or you have a, 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 an understanding, a nearness of God um, above the rest? Well, for me, it's, it's definitely music and painting. Mm -hmm. You know, music has always been a muse of mine. I've done it. I've, I've been in Christian bands and secular bands. I was, I won't bore you, but I was, I was signed right out of high school mm -hmm. to a post-punk band. We were not a Christian band. So right out of high school, I was in a post-punk band. But later on, I joined a folk band called Canterbury. And we were Christian. All of us were Christians, but we weren't necessarily doing Christian music. But then the third band I did, we were called Widow's Might. And that song mm -hmm. that I sang, Testament of Devotion, yeah. was from the band Widow's Might. Oh, wow. okay. And so music has always been one of my muses. But honestly, I think painting is one of the ones that slows me down. Hmm. I get more thoughtful and contemplative just because you have to. Yeah. Well, that, that uh, segues perfectly with this next question that Noelle wrote in from uh, our church online platform. She says, do you think our, cult our current culture and maybe even church culture in particular emphasizes creativity enough or are we too focused on productivity? Oh, boy. Great, great question. I think... A lot of times we do f think more about productivity. Mm. You know, just using the arts to serve its purpose. But I think God, and he's our model, that he is the exemplar of creating for creation's sake. Mm. You know, for the sake of, of, you know, he looked at it and he called it good. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, it, it, the Lord looked at it and he said, boy, that is good. In and of itself, yeah. creating is good. So the arts, you know, it could serve a purpose. It could be worship music. It could be a, a painting of, of, of a scripture. But in and of itself, all art has an element of beauty. And in my book, Beauty and the Banana, I talk about that. And I don't want to get too much in deep. But beauty really consists of three things. It consists of ontology, the fact that it is, it exists, mm. therefore it has an element of beauty. Mm. It has teleology, which means it has form and function and our understanding of that form. And then it has transcendence. It points to something greater than itself. Mm. So I think art in of itself should be um, done just because we do it. 
I like that. Just as we are made in his image. That's exactly right. We're creative beings. Yeah, that's great. Well, Brian, this book tilt, <clears throat> the spelling, I'm an expert speller. T-I-L-T. Does that mean, is that just why that word? Does that mean anything? Is there yeah, it has an two acronym meanings. behind that? Yeah, there, there is. So it has two meanings. If you were to read it in the beginning, it talks about a head tilt. We've all experienced it. You're, you, you know, you're looking at something and then you do this. You go, huh, that's interesting. You tilt your head. So it is, it is a, a natural human hmm. function that we tilt our head. And that really is saying that there's an intellectual curiosity or appetite about something. Hmm. But yes, TILT also stands for uh, an acronym. So at the end of the book, I use an acronym. And so the T is take time. So if you want to understand something in culture, you have to take time to understand it. Yeah. I is for investigate. So you have to dig a little bit deeper to really understand what it is you're looking at or hearing or studying. L is listen hmm. to what others have to say about it or listen to the artwork or listen to experts on it. Listen to others hmm. of what they have to say to it. And then T is to tell others. And so I kind of did that. I went out. I took the time to go exploring for people. I investigated it. I listened to what the people or the objects or the art had to say. And then I told you about it in a book. But tilt is something we could all do and we all should do. That's great. Hey, this is from Pam online. How can those of us who are artists best steward our God-given gifts? That's a great question. I think I, it always comes down for me is three Ds. Discipline, you have to sit down and do it. Hmm. You know, you have to sit down and practice what it is you're doing. So as I mentioned, I every week write songs. Mm -hmm. Every week I paint. Hmm. I do it week. It's not just when the muse hits or inspiration or, man, I'm feeling really inspired, so I'm going to do it. No, I have discipline. Mm -hmm. Discipline. And then secondly, I think the second D is look at the details of life. Hmm. You know, as a painter, you know, you, you see things that other people see. You know, a lot of people just see this tree, but painters may see a particular aspect of that. Hmm. As, a, as, a, as a novelist, someone may be listening to the details of how you speak or watching how you move, and then they're going to write about it. Or a poet may hear a turn of phrase, and then they may incorporate that. So, so the, the, the second D. And then the third aspect is kind of what I sung about, is make it a devotion. Hmm. Make what you do part of your devotional life. Slow down. Give it unto the Lord. Use it prayerfully and purposefully and see what God does with it. That's so good. Brian, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for writing the books that you've written. Hey, I want to highlight one more book that's going to be available over at, the, at the, uh, the table over there. This is a children's book. You've written a few children's book yeah. books. Yes? Th this one's cool, though. I, by the way, and I, I don't mean to, you know, Pat, but both Tilt and The Voyage of Brandon McCurdy were finalists for the New Mexico, Arizona Book Awards. That's great, yeah. So it's, pre it's pretty cool. Well so, done. So the finals. But I co-wrote this with Pastor Skip. Now, I don't know if you could see this, but there is a cartoon version of Pastor Skip. A cartoon version of Pastor Skip. Now, did you draw that? No. Our, our former artist, Dominic Cedillo, who okay. was in the art department, uh, illustrated it. So I used to tell this story to my son, Isaiah, hmm. Brendan. That's him right there. Brendan Isaiah. I used to tell him this story. And I thought one of the fun ways to illustrate Skip's say, play, and pray model mm. was to tell a story about Genesis. So we did this. We, uh, we got some, a little bit of recognition for it. So that will be over there as well. It's a great gift for a grandkid or a, a, one of your kids. Cool. Hey, well, we are grateful for you, Brian. Thanks, Matt. And uh, we're continuing in the summer reading series next week. We're going to have Dominic Doan out here to talk about his book, his most recent book, Your Longing Has a Name. And it's about how we can find purpose in this life that we're living in, no matter what struggle or suffering that we might be 
going through. But let's, um, let's pray. Let's, I want to pray over your week, and then we're going to have Brian over here. All of those books are available. He'll be doing a book signing. And let's make sure that we also pray for the kids that are attending VBS this week. Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for this weather that we get to experience. Thank you for this world that you created that we get to live in. Thank you for the trees that we get to look at, that they are your thoughts, vis visual, visible. And uh, Lord, we ask that you would help us to take these principles of slowing down and observing and appreciating and worshiping you. And Father, right now we want to pray for all of the kiddos that are going to be on our campus tomorrow and the next day. We want to pray for the teachers. Lord, equip and fill the teachers and the servants with strength as they have two more days with these 500 kids that are on campus. Lord, we ask that you would draw them to yourself and that you would put a fire in their hearts to follow you and make more disciples of you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.